Welcome to another exciting episode of Mission Compliance, Unleashing Growth Potential for Defense Contractors. Today, we embark on a fascinating journey to unravel the mysteries surrounding encryption and the pivotal role in NIST SP-800-171 compliance. Join us as we explore the nuances, challenges, and best practices of leveraging encryption to safeguard sensitive data in the defense industry. Get ready to unlock the secrets to achieving robust cybersecurity measures and ensuring compliance with confidence. So whether you're a defense contractor aiming to win more contracts or simply someone interested in bolstering your cybersecurity knowledge, you're in the right place. Broncos country, let's ride. We're joined once again today by Mike Peter, the So Mike, we've talked about encryption before, mostly in regards to compliance controls, and we actually will again on our next episode. So we'll be on this topic for a while. But today, we're going to talk more specifically about encryption itself. So with that being said, how does encryption contribute to protecting controlled unclassified information or CUI? Yeah, so that's a that's a really terrific question, Roman. Um, you know, and, and to answer that question, I think the best way is to sort of back up just a little bit uh, to the core fundamentals of how do we protect CUI? Um, and, you know, you have to sort of read all the controls and sort of read a lot of the, the background uh, sort of understanding that NIST gives on this compliance standard to dilute down to the concept of how is CUI protected? And the answer to that is there are two ways that you can protect CUI. There's protecting it physically. So in other words, you can physically protect CUI uh, using some sort of physical safeguard or physical control. Um, and then the other way you can do it is you can do it with encryption. Now, there's sort of an if-then statement, if you will, uh, which is if you are using encryption, then that encryption must be FIPS 140-2 validated encryption, i.e. an encryption standard in use that the government has reviewed, approved for use, and said, hey, yep, this is secure enough. Um, now, there's a lot of debate out there about some of the, some of the standards that are FIPS 140-2 validated, but the idea is that the government wants to know that you're not just encrypting, but you're encrypting with a standard that's known and that is a standard that is you know, sufficient for the protection of CUI. Now, one other thing is, I know we're going to talk a lot about encryption, uh, especially now this episode and then the next episode. I think it's also worthwhile saying that the preferable way to protect CUI is actually physical. And I'll give two examples of that. One is obviously you can do things in a secure facility. Number one way to secure, you know, no, number one way to do security on CUI, put it in a building where nobody else can access it that's not supposed to have it. It really just doesn't get more secure than that. You want evidence? We put bad people in jail, right? Jail is a physical security standard. So th that's number one is. Um, now, number two is uh, when it comes to talking about the concepts of security, then you get into this whole different realm of, well, okay, what about you know the network and things like that? Well, your network, generally speaking, is going to be physically protected by your building. So we get even more interesting feedback, which is that if... CUI is the only way you're protecting, uh, excuse me, if encryption is the only way that you're protecting CUI, well, then that's got to be FIPS 140-2 validated. However, if the reality is, is that that CUI is also physically protected within your office's network, well, you don't need it to be FIPS 140-2 compliant because it's otherwise physically protected by the building and that's adequate. So, you know, a lot of people take encryption and they sort of over apply it with NIST SP-80171. And there are some really wild things that can happen when they do that. One of my favorite examples is everybody knows there's a group policy called FIPS mode. So people think you have to go into group policy and you have to enable FIPS mode. Well, if you do that, it's going to break the majority of programs out there. Great example, Intuit and their QuickBooks uh, solution will just completely break and not work on, an, on a network running in FIPS mode. And I have to tell you, especially for a lot of small defense contractors, what are they using? They're using QuickBooks. They're using QuickBooks over a network, right? They've probably got one bookkeeper, maybe maybe a CEO, one or two other key people that might have to access QuickBooks. And it just completely breaks it. It's really, um, you know, it's, it's a total no-go. So again, you know, this understanding actually comes from a really awesome guy named Gary Jassane. Gary wrote about 70% of the original NIST SP-80171 standard. And I actually had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him over email where we discussed the concepts, uh, well, many concepts around NIST in, in terms of our original understanding. 
but but primarily the over application of encryption in NIST SP80171. Another phenomenal example is the concept of data at rest. Data at rest does not have to be encrypted. It just simply doesn't. There is no place in NIST SP80171 where it says the data at rest or data on a server has to be encrypted. It just doesn't exist. Um, you know, it might exist in other compliance standards, but if you're a defense contractor and we're talking about DFARS, NIST, and CMMC, it just simply doesn't apply. Now, that changes when you have a mobile device. NIST does specifically call out mobile devices and a requirement for encryption. Why? Because, uh, well, the mobile device is known to be in a more risky situation. It's going to exist outside of a secure facility for sure. That's, it's portable. That's the whole point is to take it with you. So there are some different scenarios where encryption really does change. Now that brings about the idea of a USB thumb drive or portable hard drive. You know, is that a mobile device? Well, technically it is not a mobile computing device. It doesn't do any compute. Uh, it is just simply storage. And so you are required to protect storage uh, or, or data, you know, CUI on, on you know, digital mediums. Uh, at rest. You, it doesn't say how you have to protect that. And that is a specific omission that you do not have to encrypt data on a thumb drive. You just don't. However, and, um, you know, again, the devices that do compute, those they have to, uh, they, they have to encrypt that. So very, very interesting uh, because it's so often misunderstood. So then, of course, you know, the next logical question is, well, when do I have to actually encrypt and, and when do I have to encrypt using, you know, FIPS 140-2 standards? I always tell people, I think there are two common scenarios where that exists. Number one is VPN. You cannot physically protect a VPN. You just can't. There's no way to do it. It is an ability to access secure company data on the network, but from outside of the network with no physical protection. Therefore, a VPN is one thing that really needs to be configured in FIPS mode. Another one is wireless. You cannot physically protect something that's wireless. It just like there's no physical thing to protect. Yet that signal, you don't really know how far it can trail off and go. So for that reason, also your wireless really needs to be in a FIPS 140-2 uh, compliant encryption mode. Uh, I like you know WPA2, WPA3 Enterprise. Those are two that we you know commonly recommend. Uh, and again, you just can't physically protect a wireless signal, and that that's the reason there. So. Uh, boy, hope that hope that answers the question. I know that's a big, 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 long answer, but it's also it's not an easy question because there's a lot of different scenarios that you have to answer for, and so there's a lot of information that you know IT managers and those people who are responsible, even small business owners who are going to have to get compliant with this. There's a lot there to understand. Yeah, no, that was a that was a packed answer because I I don't think there's anything easy about encryption in general, and that that leads me to the next thing, which you know, when when we think about encryption, because we've seen so so many TV shows and movies that we all, we automatically think about hackers, and that's a very real uh, that's a very real threat in in the, in the defense industry and in cybersecurity and that kind of thing. So, but but we think about encryption, we think that it's that it has has to be this big complicated thing and all this sort of stuff. So, are are there any common misconceptions or myths surrounding encryption that uh, and 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 compliance with NIST? Yeah, I mean, I think again, kind of like I I went through. You know, I was talking with a company just the other day, and they said, "Yeah, we're going to go get the you know expensive self encrypting hard drives and all this other stuff." And I said, "Well, is, is the you know is this server going to be in in a locked room in your office?" And they said, "Yeah." I said, "What you know, you can do that. I don't want to persuade you not to do it." But what I will tell you is I don't think it's necessary to do that for compliance. You know, it's in a locked room, it's safe, it's secure. And as long as you've got FIPS mode, and, uh, you know, turned on with your VPN, there's just no need. So I think data at rest and encryption is a big, big confusion point. Um, if you look at some of the other compliance standards out there like HIPAA and, and you know, ISO and, you know, even some SOX related stuff for banking, um, you know, there are standards out there, and I'm not saying that they're those that I just mentioned, but there are some standards out there that do call for data encryption at rest. NIST SP80171 does not. Interestingly, why doesn't it? Well, the reality is it's just not really a very practical protection method. It doesn't make any sense. The data is sitting on a hard drive. It's not going anywhere, right? As long as it's physically protected. And there, and there is a compliance control around physically protecting your facility properly. So it kind of tells me, look, encryption is great. 
uh, certainly encryption of data in transit is necessary. No question about that, especially if it's over the internet. But the reality is encryption is not that great. You know, if you have a hard drive crash on you, you can't go get the data back if it was encrypted. It's a real, it's a real nightmare. Uh, there's some other, you know, challenges with encryption. It slows down data processing because it has to encrypt and decrypt on its way in and out. It kills performance. It's just simply not really the best option for data protection. Um, you know, it's 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 not. So I think that's kind of another really big, you know, myth is if I apply encryption everywhere, I'm going to be okay. Well, no. I mean, let's talk about the rest of your network. Let's talk about the rest of what it is that's going on to protect that CUI because physical safeguards should be number one. So, you know, I think that's that's a really, a really you know, big misconception, a big misunderstanding. And, um, you know, a lot of people uh, just have it wrong. Right. So, so you talked about it a little bit, you talked about, you talked about the challenges of encryption and that kind of thing, but feel free to elaborate on that more because are, 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 are there any other challenges or considerations when implementing encryption for compliance? Yeah, I think there's a lot of considerations. So when we start talking about considerations, we're talking about a lot more than just, do we encrypt? Do we need to encrypt? Is it, do we need to encrypt for, you know, compliance? What's, so the first thing that I would say is, Figure out why you're encrypting. You know, um, when it comes to PCs that are mobile workstations or mobile devices, phones, tablets, et cetera, they're going to have CUI on them. You know, we have to think through the reasoning there and what's what's best. A lot of these have encryption baked into the operating system or into the chipset. By far and away, that is the best. Uh, there are third-party applications out there, like Symantec has some, some encryption software. That's going to make your system run a lot slower. So we want to think about, well, does this does the speed of our system matter, right? Um, a, a great example of this is if I was building a heavy duty AutoCAD workstation for an engineering person, I would really not want to drive to encrypt those drives. That may be the decision maker between a laptop and a desktop for me. I mean, it, it just might be, right? Uh, if you need absolute maximum performance and the difference between a render is an hour and three hours, I'm doing it on a desktop with an unencrypted drive every time. You know, sorry, you're just going to have to come do this work in the office. And, and most engineers are used to that. Um, so I think there's really substantial considerations, you know, that can affect more than you think when it comes to encryption. Another one is, you know, when's the right time to implement encryption? If you're three months away from a firewall swap out, right, and you're not under audit at that moment. And, you know, I'll give you a great example. Sonic wall, you have to, you have to wipe that firewall to get it into FIPS mode when it essentially has its firmware written and, and its operating system rewritten during a, re, a, a recycle. Um, sorry, the uh, term is escaping me right now. Um, that's, it's not really a great thing to have to wipe and reload a firewall. Like that's, mm -hmm. you know, you got to either do it after hours and then boy, if you're a bigger organization, you're really holding your breath, hoping that it's not a big deal to get that configuration back on there. Uh, if you're like two months away, three months away from swapping out a firewall, you know, just take a minute and get the new firewall right. I think you can probably have a temporary, you know, um, exception, you know, a temporary deficiency on this control uh, if it means not disrupting work. So again, obviously that's, you know, we have to apply this reasonably, uh, but that is generally speaking what the self-assessment guidelines tell you to do. Now, again, if you've got a high level audit and they're about to come into your office, you better have your, you better have your, uh, your ship in shape, if you will. Um, so I, I think that's another, all those things really have to be considered. Um, and I think those are all good things to, to consider as well. Another one is, even though it may not be required, what is reasonable to encrypt? Here's a great example. If I have to go out and buy new thumb drives for my personnel so I can catalog them and, and have them in, in my CUI media access log, and, you know, we need new thumb drives anyway, insert the reason here, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider strongly, should I just go get an encrypted thumb drive anyway? Because it just makes sense. And the expense is not really super great when, I've only, when I only need three of them in my organization. That's another, another way to look at this is, should we just do this the right way? And so I think that's another consideration with encryption is, if you look at, if you look at the puzzle or you look at the instance and go, you know, I really should run with drive encryption on these servers because maybe the server has a public facing web interface. And even though there's no publicly accessible CUI, still there is a higher than normal likelihood for vulnerability because there is a public interface open on that server. You know, that might be an instance where I look at it from a security perspective 
not a compliance perspective, but a security perspective and go, you know, I don't have to do it, but I, I probably should go ahead and roll some encryption on this thing. And you know what? It'll look good in my system security plan anyway. And I think that I will know that I've done everything that I can do to really maximize security on this on this particular device. Uh, so many, many good examples there. There you go. Absolutely. Great topic. We're Obviously, I said we're going to do a couple episodes on it in a row. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to encryption. But but Mike, you know what time it is now. You know, you know, we we talk about encryption and can get can get a little interesting and that kind of thing. We like to to lighten it up when we can. So we always do a, a silly question on this podcast. And today's has to do with encryption because that is the title today, sort of. So I've heard of a smart home. You know, you 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 hook up your lights and your speakers and everything in your house to oftentimes a voice activated thing. And it, it does it all for you. And like, like, like I said, where everything's voice activated or done with the touch of a button on your phone or wherever. C can I have an encrypted house? Something like bur burglars can't break in without a code or an authorized user? I don't see why not. I think it'd probably be a little tough to encrypt your whole house. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a great example, right? I don't have normal like locking keys on my house at all. It's all internet connected digital uh, digital locks all around my house. So I can open and close locks, you know, through my smartphone. And um, I'm not a big fan of that to tell you the truth. So uh, I certainly would not want my lock and unlock signals to be unencrypted where they could be picked up by somebody else. So, you know, the reality is the smart home of today needs to be encrypted. Encryption is very, very important. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm reading some articles lately on quantum encryption. Uh, you know, the bad guys keep getting, you know, better at what they do in terms of decryption. Uh, but, you know, there are some people out there, Apple in particular has got this really cool quantum encryption stuff that they're playing with. And um, you know what, I got to tell you, it's really important to, uh, to, to have those kinds of things because we do need better locks on our doors. And uh, the home is no different. You know, the home is no different. Another example is like, for instance, camera systems in the home. More and more people have camera systems in their home. They have smart doorbells. They have smart cameras to watch their kids when they're upstairs. Uh, I know that I'm building a house right now. And one of the goals that I have is to put cameras, uh, you know, in, in some of the upstairs areas so that I can keep an eye on my small children. Um, you know, I certainly want that signal encrypted. Uh, and uh, real, realistically, uh, you know, I will I will make that encryption a FIPS 140-2 standard encryption because I know that that's probably the best encryption that we can really put into place. Now, on that note, I'm going to sidebar for a second because I think there's one topic we didn't cover, which is reasonable to cover on this. There are a lot of articles out there that talk about the idea that FIPS 140-2 encryption is not as secure as other kinds of encryption. And what I'm going to tell you is I don't disagree, but I'm not here to argue over what kinds of encryption work. I think any kind of encryption is good encryption. Uh, I'm here to help you guys get compliant. I'm helping you to be here to help you win more defense business. And I don't really get caught up very much in the debate over whether you should really use FIPS 140 2 compliant, you know, encryption. What I know is I want to feel great when the assessor walks in the room or DIBCAC and has my multi million dollar defense contract on the line. And, you know, to, to accomplish that, we just simply implement the 142 2 uh, 140-2 uh, compliant encryption. Look, guys, we're talking about AES 256, 128, stuff like that. It's it's almost everywhere. TLS is also, uh, you know, FIPS 140-2. These are all common technologies. So it's not like we really have to stretch very far. I will say that there are some, you know, quote unquote, more advanced encryption standards out there. And they haven't been vetted by the federal government to a point where they're comfortable recommending them. Um, I would stay away from those. I think you know, you can always go to them later when the federal government's had their chance to vet them. But I think it's really important. So sorry, I had to had to sneak that sidebar in there. But uh, yeah, I would say if you're, you know, if you're talking about your home, what's more important to protect than your home? So of course, you should have encryption. Look, look how relevant that ended up being. I love it when that happens. But uh, there, there, there was a uh, back when I was a kid, there was a Disney Channel original movie called Smart House, where it was something like this, where 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 it was like Alexa and that kind of thing before Alexa was a thing. And and during a particular there was a during the movie, there was a breach of the house and and like a big metal door slid down over the front door bars 
uh, came over the windows. I was like, that's what needs to happen if a burglar tries to tries to come in. Just the whole house just locks down. That's it. Well, we would call that a honeypot, Roman. <laughs> so there's there's an actual device called a honeypot, which is essentially a fake server that appears to be a server and it appears to be easily hackable. And what it will do is essentially it will sit isolated on your network and allow for a bad guy to be attracted to it so that uh, if there is a problem, uh, they're going to go and hack the honeypot. And then the honeypot is set up to record activities and figure out who it was and all those kinds of things. Very, very interesting. Uh, very interesting for security and things like that. And, uh, you know, such a thing does exist. So as they say, you could probably catch more bees with honey. Well, maybe they should come up with a different name because I imagine that when Winnie the Pooh's life is, is is about to take a sharp downturn based on calling it a honeypot. It's true. Well, I don't want to be the Eeyore in the situation, but it's... there there you go. <laughs> and that wraps up another great episode of Mission Compliance. We hope our discussion today has provided you with valuable insights, practical strategies, and inspiration to navigate the ever-evolving world of defense. We'd like to thank Mike for, for providing us with valuable insights valuable insights on the crucial topic of encryption and how to keep your your information safe thanks mike hey always a pleasure roman but the conversation doesn't end here we encourage you to keep exploring these topics and connect with us on our social media channels share your thoughts ask questions and engage with fellow listeners using the hashtag mission compliance podcast if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to your favorite podcast platform so you always know when new episodes like this one are released. And we'd really appreciate it if you could take a moment to rate and review the show. Your feedback helps us to continue to bring you thought-provoking episodes and high-quality content. Join us again next time as we delve further into the dynamic world of defense, security, and industry innovation. Until then, take care, stay informed, and make compliance your mission. See you next time. Thanks, everybody.